our minister reminds us from time to time that what makes a church a church is its life as a story maker over decades unto centuries. A church is a continuous story making community that binds together its generations and then transcends them. Our church as a legal corporation or as a property holder can be said to have come into being 150 years ago this year in 1870. By three years thereafter, however, its small chapel at 12th and 8th Streets had actually become a rental hall. It was peopled by worshiping universalists only sporadically when an occasional preacher could be lured to town as a guest. Over the next 10 years, in the midst of nationwide financial panic and region-wide locust infestations, Universalist Society's supporters were reduced to a handful of squabblers who together could do little more than muster a plaintive cry for help and send it to the Universalist General Convention. The arrival of that cry into the ears of two persons there, a young couple just planning marriage, marks the real beginning of our life as a church, in my view, and I want to introduce them to you. I introduce to you first Kate Matthews. Here's how that cry reached her eyes and ears. In February 1883, I was teaching school in Meriden, Connecticut, my hometown, and Mr. Chapman was pastor of the Grove Hall Church in one of the most delightful suburbs of Boston, having been called to the place before he graduated from Tufts University Theological School. I was looking forward to life in that interesting city and among most congenial people. On arriving home one afternoon, I found a letter from Mr. C stating that the General Convention had written to him to know if he would go out to Lincoln, Nebraska, as the church there had appealed for help. It would be hard work, uncertain and small salary. What did I think about starting out March 1st? You can fancy that I didn't have much appetite for supper. I cried all night, but with the morning I rose with a clear vision. I wrote that he must follow the dictates of his conscience, and wherever that led, I would follow and do my share, but we would not be married at once. He would have to come back after me if he went in March. He agreed to my plan and preached his sermon in Lincoln, March 12th, I think, 1883. So now I introduce you to Evan Chapin. Kate's Mr. C. To the Universalist Conference, he was a Western man. His undergraduate studies had been taken at Lombard College in Galesburg, Illinois, before he went to Tufts. And that was why they thought he might come to Lincoln, which others had declined. On March 11, 1883, the day before that first sermon here, the Nebraska State Journal published his purpose in answering the cry for help. We purpose to organize every department of our work at the earliest moment, and to do all that we can in the direction of a broad, earnest, constructive religious movement. We do not desire to do a merely critical, negative, and destructive work. We cordially invite and urge the cooperation of all liberal Christians of whatever name, and who sympathize with us in our views and purposes, and who can cooperate with us heartily in the advancement of these. We think it possible to make liberal and rational Christianity a permanent and assured success, a growing and beneficent power in our midst. Evans' first challenge, however, was to invite and urge cooperation of the members of his own small congregation. That first week, he interviewed people whose names he found on the list of former members, the outs, they were called. He reported his talks to the current church leaders and he was told that they did not get him out here to make friends with those people, but to get them out, root and branch. And he replied that if he stayed, he should endeavor to unite all the discordant elements. The next morning, the leaders told him he could stay if he cared to do so, but that his course of action would only result in the loss of a liberal church in the city. He ministered solo through the spring and the summer, his church consisted of parts of just five or six families. In October, then, he went east to attend the Universalist Convention and to marry Kate Matthews. 
Together they boarded the train heading west, reaching Lincoln just before Thanksgiving. And here's what Kate found and what she started to do. I found the Sunday school consisted of Mr. C's class of two young women and two young men. I started a second class with Fred Sexton as sole member. It grew to 14 boys in a year's time. We organized our class and called it the Builders. Miss Preen organized the girls of the same age, the Lend a Hand Club. There was a spirited rivalry between the two. At the end of the year, if we had a congregation of 25, we were so elated we smiled all the rest of the week. Now the windows through which we can view the next 13 years are small and scattered, but oh so tantalizing. Marianne Meisner, our member now, has found that her great-great-great-aunt, Lorena George Fowler, actually drowned in the year 1886 here in Lincoln when her runaway horse with buggy went into Salt Creek. On March the 1st of that year, it's recorded, her funeral service was held in the Universalist Church. For Lorena was a member of the International Order of Grand Templars, a temperance organization, and Evan Chapin was a temperance leader. In other fireside chats, you've heard the story of Mary Manell's central role in first gathering the church and erecting its first chapel. Well, just two weeks after Lorena Fowler's funeral, the Nebraska State Journal gave notice of Ms. Manell's death in San Francisco. And later, the paper recorded the sermon that Evan gave at the fifth anniversary of his arrival in Lincoln. Whatever this church might be in the future, it will be that in no small degree, because Mary Monell was so faithful to the cause she loved in her day and generation. It is not usual for the Universalist Church to canonize its dead, but I cannot think of this woman without feeling that she was our patron saint. We are now united and prepared for Christian work. We need more thorough organization. We need more labor to make the church a permanent institution. Universalism has noble ideas and sentiments, but to benefit from them ourselves and to benefit the world with them, they must be put into tangible form. Their instrument is the church. Through it, through your loyalty, may we, may we rise up higher into the divine life. Kate gives us another snapshot of the church's worship life. We had the best quartet choir in the city with Mr. and Mrs. Woolley, tenor and soprano, Miss Beardsley, contralto, and Mr. C, bass. I was organist and had charge of the music. Later on, Mr. Hillman sang bass and Mr. McCarver, tenor. The latter always brought two small black and tan dogs who kept out of sight until the closing hymn, when they mounted the rostrum and faced the audience with Mr. C. And the church's historians have faithfully celebrated Evans' record of community ministry. He was school board member for six years. He was co-founder of the Charity Organization Society. In 1910, the State Journal recalled that when the city administration fell into bad hands, the Reverend Chapin shamed a good many people into taking an interest in public affairs. When the gambling houses were reopened, he visited them personally in search of evidence to close them back up again. Perhaps most memorable for many was Evans' work to organize Lincoln's first ministerial union and then to find himself voted out of its ranks when its members adopted an evangelical basis for membership. Three other clergy, the rector of the Trinity, Episcopal Church, the pastor of First Congregational Church, and the pastor of First Christian Church all resigned their memberships to protest Evans' ouster. In fact, in Kate's recollection, public sympathy on that account enabled Evan to galvanize the congregation to raise the original chapel at 12th and H and to replace it with a large, imposing red sandstone structure. That building was dedicated in 1893. From this great height, though, in just three more short years, the debt that was taken to build that new church and the nation's financial reversals and the church's continued dependence on the General Association assistance all worked to end the Chapin's time in Lincoln. With Kate back east visiting family in the spring of 1896, Evan wrote to her, 
I shall have no trouble at all in leaving Nebraska when the time comes to go. If the parish pays us $15 a week and we receive the appropriation of $500 from the general convention, we stay. If either fails to do this, we go. And you may rest assured that there will be no compromise on my part. And Kate later recorded, The general convention failed to rise to the occasion, and we left Lincoln in July 1896. The measure of any ministry, though I believe, is the vitality of the church after the minister's departure. In another fireside chat, you have learned of church board secretary Ira Hatfield's work following the Chapin's departure to hold the church together as it sought out some way to pay the debt incurred in building that new building and to re-employ the minister. In 1901, Hatfield wrote to Evan, for two years the people of the Lincoln Parish have maintained complete church services without a pastor, holding preaching services every Sunday, usually with some member of the church in the pulpit. A young people's meeting was held every Sunday evening, keeping up a good and efficient Sunday school and conducting the social and helpful organizations like the Ladies' Aid Society. At the end of that time, the members determined that their best future was attainable by disbanding as a Universalist church and reincorporating as a Unitarian church. And practically every one of those connected with the Universalist church afterwards became identified with All Souls Unitarian. Ninety-seven people signed on as charter members. At their departure from Lincoln, Evan returned to the Illinois campus of Lombard College to serve as professor of applied theology at their divinity school for three years. And then the family moved again, now to serve the Universalist Church in Rockland, Maine. But ten years later, in 1909, Evan Chapin died. He was just 53. Kate survived Evan by almost 40 years. She saw their three children, Charles, Elsa, and Neely, go to be respectively a successful businessman, a professor of English in New York, and a naval admiral. She lived first in Santa Barbara, California, and then in New York, New York, and finally in Montpelier, Vermont, where she died in 1948 at the age of 87. Ten years following their departure, the church held a service commemorating the Chapin's work here together, and several speakers celebrated their joint contributions to Lincoln's music, to its social welfare, and, of course, to our church. And at the service's conclusion, these sepia portraits of each of them in large form were presented for display in the church. So thank you, Kate, and thank you, Evan for our trip.